this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore conversations and questions from a Christian perspective. And, you know, in this, uh, in this show, it's often uh, fun when I'm talking to somebody that uh, I don't know or I've never talked to before, and I'm learning things uh, from that person. But I like it better uh, when I'm talking to friends so that I can kind of bring you into a conversation that's already going on. Uh, and, and so I'm glad to have that happening today, even though it's precipitated by a sad uh, situation for both of us. Um, my guest today is Peter Weiner, who is Senior Fellow at the Trinity Forum. Uh, he writes for The Atlantic, and you've probably read him in many, many places over the years. And uh, this uh, past a couple of weeks, he wrote a piece, really beautiful piece in The Atlantic called My Friend Mike Gerson, uh, which was about uh, our, our friend Mike, who died of, uh, of cancer at the age of 58. Um, I'd known Mike uh, for a little over 10 years. Pete uh, had known Mike really well, had a close friendship with Mike that went back uh, many years, back to when they both uh, served uh, in the George W. Bush administration. And so the, the article, this piece, was really uh, beautiful. Now, some of you will know Michael Gerson. You will have read uh, his uh, columns in the Washington Post, or you will have seen him on television or in some other uh, format, but some of you won't. And uh, this show is for you because we're dealing with something that all of us are dealing with. Questions of grief, questions of loss, questions of friendship. Uh, I find that I, I'm getting these questions about friendship at an increasing pace where people are asking, how do I find friends? How do I make friends? What do I do when friendships are split apart by political differences or religious differences or church differences? How, how can I mend that up or, or is it possible? What do I do about loneliness, either in my own life or all around me? So we're going to talk about all of those things today. And so Pete Weiner, thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to be with you, Russell. I'm a huge admirer of yours, uh, of uh, of your faith, and uh, and of your character and your courage. So um, I uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you and 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 part of uh, CT. Well, likewise. And uh, the piece that you did, my friend Mike Gerson, um, it hit me uh, really hard, and I, I think I think for a couple of reasons. I mean, we we have a, a book club uh, together, which is really, a, in many ways, kind of a lifeline <laughs> for, for me. It's just a, it's a, it's a unique experience of, uh, of fellowship that my wife knows. And to read you writing about somebody who's always, who was always there and won't be anymore hit hard. But then I thought to myself, what if I didn't know either of them? And I thought this piece would still uh, hit that hard because it's dealing with something really universal uh, when it comes to friendship and to grief. You talk about in that piece that you joked to Mike in, in one of the, the times uh, leading up uh, to his death of all of the biblical characters that you could emulate. Why did you choose Job? Uh, because of he had, he had been through these health uh, problems for so long. Um, and it is kind of remarkable uh, to see in Mike, and I've seen it in some other people who suffer so well. What do you think it is in people that causes them to be a model uh, when it comes to suffering? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, and Mike really did suffer uh, suffer well. Um, I should say that um, in the last few weeks of his life. Um, and he went through a, an unbelievable set a litany of, of, of issues, um, including uh, first he had kidney cancer, and then it spread and metastasized to lung cancer, adrenal cancer, um, and bone cancer, uh, which is what he, he died from. He also had Parkinson's disease, but it was very painful. Um, in the last several uh, weeks of his life, when he was in the hospital, 
I uh, helped coordinate with some others, people to see Mike um, one or two at a time, uh, once or twice a day, depending on, on how well that he felt. And it was a chance for people to express to him what he meant to them um, and him even in a very weakened state to express what, uh, what they meant to him. And what was striking to me and to others was the through line of those last few weeks and really through all of Mike's life and even through the suffering that began years ago was gratitude. Mm. Um, what moved him most, what moved him to tears in those last few weeks is he spoke about gratitude, even in the midst of this um, terrible pain and, and suffering that he, that he went through. So he really, he really did um, suffer well. What is it that, that um, allows people to suffer well? It's it's a deep question. I mean, I think some of it probably just goes to disposition and 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 temperament and attitude toward uh, toward uh, life. Uh, Mike himself uh, sort of referred to himself as a uh, as almost a reflexive Calvinist. So he never really dealt with the, the questions of why God, why why me. Those mm-hmm. he didn't feel that those were questions were off limits by any means. It's just not ones that he struggled with. Um, there was a sense of dignity in Mike. I, I know that he wanted um, to um, conduct himself in a way that reflected well above all to his two boys, uh, um, uh, Nick and Bucky. Um, so that was part of it. And then uh, faith was a very deep part of it. Um, faith was so inextricable to who Mike was. Um, and it touched, I think, almost every area of his life. Not perfectly. He was an imperfect person. He would be the first person to tell you that. But I think every area of his life was to one degree or another touched by faith, um, including um, that maybe even preeminently um, the, 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 the road to, uh, to, to death. And the fact that he felt like, uh, you know, we were citizens of, of, of another kingdom, of another world, um, gave him hope, the kind of hope that we as people of the Christian faith rely on. Um, but, you know, you you never really know um, mm-hmm. how deep it goes or how it manifests itself until the critical moments of life, until yeah. there's pain or there's loss or there's suffering. And, um, you know, we like to think that we're going to hold up well, but we're never sure. Um, but but um, but he 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 did and he did model um not only for his boys, but for the rest of us, how to how to suffer well and and how to withstand and help uh, pain uh, with with dignity and grace. You know, I I think every time that I I see God's grace at work in, in that way, I just realize what an ungrateful person I am, because I experience gratitude, but it seems to me that those those moments of really intense gratitude sort of come in flashes, and, and, and I don't live out a life where I'm stopping to pay attention to, look at what God has given you. Are you grateful uh, for this? And it seems to me that somebody, to have that kind of disposition uh, at the end of life, gratitude has to be cultivated. Uh, I, I wonder, how, how do you cultivate gratitude in the, in the daily, in the ordinary, rather than in just the crises? Yeah, um, I will say that I, I think it's probably true of almost all of us, right? Which is the best moments in life come in flashes. Um, that's just the, the nature of the human condition, and I suppose the human the human struggle. Um, moments of of deep insight or contemplation or gratitude, um, those kind of things, they don't sustain us, but they do come in flashes. And when they come in flashes, they often stay with us or they mark us in a way that, 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 uh, leaves an, leaves an, an imprint. Gratitude is, I, I wrote an essay actually several years ago in the New York times, one of my, uh, faith essays in the times on, on the virtue of gratitude. I think it's an under, um, underappreciated virtue, um, because I think a lot of other, uh, virtues spring from, from a sense of, of gratitude in terms of how do you how do you cultivate it? Part of it, I think, is is the the company that you keep, mm. um, which is are, are there people around you who themselves 
uh, are able to manifest gratitude and remind you of what you have to be grateful for. Uh, my wife will sometimes uh, say to, to, to me and, and to, to our children um, during moments, even if they're moments, actually often if they're moments of, of, of struggle or, or hardship, what are some of the things you're grateful for? That is just giving voice to it, just shifting mm. your perspective um, and your and your uh, and your mind your mindset, um, and having people in your life who can put the right frame on life, mm-hmm. uh, which is that there uh, are moments of of hardship, but reasons for for gratitude, including in the context of of um, of faith. I would say also that. Um, at least in, in my experience, some of it is context. It's what's the expectation of life. Mm. I think if people go into life assuming that life is going to be a walk in a park uh, and that they're owed certain yeah, things yeah. by God, by others, um, and then you, you you skin your knees and, uh, and your arms uh, once you encounter life, then you can go through it and, and it's a sense that you're always... Uh, being denied something you're owed. Yeah. Um, and so having the expectation of um, receiving with open hands and open arms um, the gifts that you're given, but to know that often life is a veil of tears and mm-hmm. it's a, and it's a struggle. Um, I found that that can be helpful um, as, um, as, as well. Boy, those high expectations really do, uh, really do crush us, whether it's in our own lives or accomplishments or relationships or, or suffering. If you, if you have that sense of I'm owed exactly what my vision of the future is. Right. Yeah, you're right. That, that does lead to a great deal of despair. Now, Pete, you've worked in Washington for a long time. I'm, I mentioned at the beginning that, that you and Mike both were serving in the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, and you served as um, you led uh, Empower America think tank. You served at uh, Ethics and Public Policy Center. You've worked with Jack Kemp and with other people uh, over the years. I'm struck by often people will say, especially in a context like Washington, which is uh, about power a great deal of the time. It's better to be feared than loved. Um, Sort of the LBJ uh, kind of mentality. But I was also struck this week by the fact that with Mike's death, he was loved more than he was feared. And, And that is what was remarkable. And it seems to me that that's what I see in the people who really have lived worthy uh, lives in that sort of a, in that sort of a context, even to the point that Yuval, uh, Yuval Levin, another friend of ours uh, in his essay said that it was, it was interesting to him that when Mike was at the height of his power in the, in the White House, that's when he was the most uh, passionate for uh, injustice against those who were weak, AIDS victims in Africa and, and other places. How how would you advise someone? Because we have listeners who are starting their careers. Maybe they're working in government. Maybe they're working in business or working in various places. How how should they think about ambition and, and power at the beginning of, of life so that they don't end up sort of being swept away by it? Yeah, that's that's a terrific question. Um uh, I agree with what, what what you said for sure. I mean, Mike wasn't feared uh, by anyone I know, but he was very much loved by by many people, and he le- lived a deeply consequential life. In part because he was loved, um, because he had he, he who he was uh, gave him a, a certain place um, in in the hearts and minds of uh, a lot of people, including influential people who who came to to love him. Um, like a brother, as President Bush said to me, I, I loved him like a, like a brother, um, and that was authentic. Um, that relationship, but out of that relationship came came great good, including what you mentioned, Pat Far. In terms of what I would recommend to people when they're when they're uh, young and they're approaching it, and, and how do you view power, and, and how do you um, inoculate yourself to the degree one can against against the dangers of it. Um, 
I say several things. Uh, the first is I just ought to remember that what's important uh, is to be faithful in your life, uh, not necessarily to be successful. I mean, that's a sort of obvious point, but it's really important um, because for one thing, it keeps obvious people from, to say, not obvious to live. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's important in part because people can become fatalistic, uh, mm-hmm. when things aren't, aren't going well, or they feel like important endeavors that they're a part of aren't turning out the way they wanted. And we don't really have control o- often over the success of an enterprise, but we do have, um, control over how faithful we are and, um, and the shape of our character. Um, and, uh, so that's one thing. The other is to understand and and to, to ha- be surrounded by people who understand what is power for. It's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. And the means to the end, certainly as people of the Christian faith, is to advance justice and the, God's kingdom and the moral good, um, to be an instrument of healing um, and uh Uh, and repair, and reconciliation, and truth. Um, It's not an end which is, you know, your own pride and your own ambition. Again, that's obvious to say it's harder to to live. All of us deal with pride, and and there's good ambition, and there's bad ambition, and all of us, most of us deal with both, and all of us have some degree of ambition, which is tainted by by uh, by pride, it's very important, I think, to to have those people around you, uh, uh, us, who can speak into your life, who have the standing in your life to be able to tell you if they, if you're beginning to go off course, mm-hmm. um, and can speak honestly to you. I think part of it is to have role models. Uh, I think it's a really big deal. I mean, and this is autobiographical, I suppose, but to have the right role models in your life. Um, you know, one of the things I do, you may do this too, Russell, from time to time. It's a very simple thing. But when I think about sometimes what I write, right, it's, and, I, and, I, and I write directly and I write forcefully, um, and sometimes there's real energy behind what I write. And there's always a question with me, which is, have I gone too far? Have I been unfair? Mm-hmm. Um, have I said things that I shouldn't have said? And I'm, I'm sure I have. But I haven't done it as often as I would have done it because... I think about certain people in my life whom I respect and admired who had shaped me. And I just say, what would they say mm-hmm. if I wrote this, if I said this, if I did this? Mm-hmm. If, if my life was open, an open book, it was not in shadows, and those people knew what was happening, what would their reaction be? Um, doesn't mean that I'm always going to follow it, um, but it does mean that there's some kind of check on um, on. Um, on the, the use of, of power and, and other things and how, how one conducts them um, themselves. The other thing is I just think that there is something of a myth. Maybe it's not a myth, but it's an incomplete view of how one has influence. And it's mm. not using power in a ruthless way um, to try and um, uh, gain standing and to have influence. There are plenty of people um, in in public life, in politics, in other arenas of life who have kept and maintained their integrity and character and been successful and been influential. And I think if you get into a mindset that pits your, you know, your own ambitions to power um, against um, moral integrity and Mm -hmm. being honest uh, and treating people decently, you know, that's that's a conflict. And sometimes they exist and you, you should choose integrity, but people don't, don't always do it. Yeah. But I'm not cynical for all my years in politics. And I think I understand the downside of politics. And I've certainly been exposed to, to people who I think their integrity has, has been questionable. Um, but I've met a lot of really good people um, of real character um, in politics um, and you can be a person of integrity and succeed in politics. And politics matters. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, people, uh, they can't um, become cynical, in my estimation, of politics, because politics is finally and fundamentally about justice, about a lot of other things, too. But it's about justice. And people of the Christian faith and others, too, can't shrug or be indifferent um, to it. So 
um, you know, you don't you don't have to be ruthless um, to to get power or to exercise power. And when you do get power, you should do it responsibly. Mm. While you were talking, I had a song running through my head, uh, Paul Simon singing, who will be my role model now that my role models are gone, <laughs> because there are, there are a lot of people who have role models in their lives, people that they've looked up to, people that um, the people that they wanted to be like, and then they're really disappointed by those people, uh, later on. And I think what's happened is for, for some people, there's a sense of fear. Uh, I can't even really learn from anybody because what happens if this person, uh, ends up just being just another, right. uh, fraud at the worst end, or even if not fraud, just a hack, you know, right. and I think that can happen in any context, in a business sure. context, a church context, a political con- context. How, how, do, how do we do that? How, how do we learn from role models even when sometimes it's just really disappointing? Yeah, I think when when there are situations in which the people that we've <clears throat> elevated to role models, heroes in our lives, and they they, they fall short, that can be a very uh, difficult experience and wounding experience. Um, and it can create some amount of cynicism in the sense of, uh, you know, every, everybody has clay feet, no one can, can be trusted, and that's a, that's a danger. But it does happen. When that happens, I think w- what we need is we need the discernment, the wisdom to be able to say, what are the qualities of that individual that are still worth emulating, mm-hmm. even if there are other areas of their lives that are not? Um, people are complicated. You pay, take people with the totality of their uh, of their acts, and some people embody um, virtues like courage, um, and they may uh, then have other vices in their life, and they exist. They can exist together, and it's the ability to see in an honest way what are the virtues, what are the vices, not throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, and and to say from this person I learned this, but I also learned that. Mm-hmm. Um, as, uh, as well. And then there are people, if you're fortunate in your life who again are not perfect, but in the sum total of their life, you say that that's, that's a person worth emulating. Yeah. Um, those are, those are the people who are trustworthy, um, who are honorable, who are trying, even if imperfectly to, to do the right thing. Um, and when you find those people, um, it matters and it and it matters to stay in touch with them, to learn from them and to give back to them. Yeah. You know, M- Maria, my wife, uh, often will groan when I say this or laugh uh, because I've often said, I love a good funeral more than I love a wedding. And she will say, that is so morbid. Uh, but the reason is because of exactly what you just said. Um, w- when I'm at a funeral for somebody who, again, not not perfect, of course, but somebody who has faithfully lived out the arc yeah. of a life, there's just so much grace uh, seen in that and so much hope seen in it. And it, I always leave, walk away sort of reminded of what matters and what yes. doesn't. And it, it sort of recalibrates uh, expectations. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. You look at that whole arc of a life and when you see fidelity and you often can, uh, it's really a it's really a, an invigorating and remarkable thing. Yeah. Well, our friend David Brooks has talked about the resume virtues and the mm-hmm. eulogy virtues. And in the end, the eulogy virtues are the ones that they matter most, and they're the ones that, when we look back over, as you said, the arc of our life, uh, those are the ones that, for most of us, um, will 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 matter. Um, how are we as friends, as 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 spouses, as sons and daughters, um, as citizens, um, and and uh, you know where what was the the moral arc of our lives? You know, I think if we were to go back in a time machine. 10 years ago to 2012, um, 2013. Uh, and we were to say to Russell Moore and Pete Wainer then, uh, your eulogy one day will probably include the words Donald Trump. 
not not probably. We'll we'll almost definitely uh, include the words Donald Trump. I think both of us would have said Donald Trump, the billionaire. What are you what are you talking about? The Apprentice guy, uh, and it would have been kind of shocking to us that that would be the case. And of course, then the next decade uh, played out, right. which. Uh, you know, we're we're very clear and on the record as to where we are. Not all of our listeners uh, have to be, and we'll have different uh, opinions, of course. But but we have come to certain conclusions, and as a result of that, uh, there are a lot of people. I know this is true of you. I I know for sure it's true of me. A lot of people who won't even speak to me uh, anymore. Uh, who who would have? Uh, who would have been very close in 2012, 2013, and. I found just thinking about that, that it applies outside of the context of that traumatic sort of division that has happened over Trump and related things over the past several years. There are there are a lot of people who even when they don't weigh into those sorts of things, they find friendships that that break apart. And and, and they find them fragmenting. And you, you wrote about this. Um, maybe a year or two ago about the evangelical breakup, talking about what's happening uh, in the church. Do you think that that's especially happening now? Is it just something that has always happened, friendships build and friendships divide? Or is there something about this moment uh, that makes that different? I think there's something about this moment that makes it different. Uh, may not be qualitatively different because um, politics and theology, um, because, precisely because they're about important matters um, and people have passions about those things and often should have passions about them. Uh, you know, relationships can be complicated by by differences over those things. If you have strongly held opinions and the person holds contrary opinions, um, then that, you know, that has the makings of strains for sure. But there's no question in my mind from my experience and the experience of most people that I know that this is a different moment, uh, that uh, churches have been split in a way that hasn't been the case before. You would know better than I, but but uh, I know an awful lot of pastors and and they testify to that. Um, and how difficult it is for pastors who are themselves not political, but dealing with congregations mm-hmm. that have been energized and animated through politics, through, through cultural issues, um, families that are that are d- divided, um, parents and children who don't speak to each other uh, anymore, people who are formerly colleagues uh, who who uh, either don't speak to each other or are angry at, at, at one another, so. Um, it's different. This is way trickier to navigate than uh, any other time in my experience in politics. And, and that's true of, of most people I know. And I don't think there's anybody that I know that would say that it's easier today than it has been um, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the past. Do you think social media is the reason for that, for the difference that we have now? I think social media is a big part of it. I don't think it's it's the only uh, only part um, of of it. Social media, I think, is plays a part uh, because it uh, it in a sense creates a kind of civic uh, culture and um, the terms of debate. I think it it pulls it down mm-hmm. um, in part because. When people are on social media, there's not the filter. There's a lot of anonymity that happens. Um, people throw out statements that they wouldn't throw out if you were person to person or if you waited five or ten minutes that you wouldn't wouldn't do. Both sides get into it, and there's a lot of a lot of heat and often not much not much light. So I think that it happens both for people who are on social media and just the radiating effects I would say of social media in terms yeah. of how we how we speak with with one another. But I think even if social media didn't exist, um, I think our politics uh, is is at a point where uh, the the anger, the grievances, the frustrations are deeper than than in the past, um, and the style of politics uh, that's that's 
being employed, I would say, especially over the last half dozen years or, or, or so. In my estimation, and I realize there are people who disagree with me, but I think it was embodied largely in, in Donald Trump. I think he validated certain approaches to politics that often people felt, but leaders in politics kept it on the fringes. And I think now we're in a time in which uh, there's a kind of dehumanization that occurs that's not only accepted, but often celebrated. Um, and so I think that's uh, that's happened. I think just a lot of guardrails have been smashed and 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 th- and thrown thrown uh, thrown away. And uh, as I said, there's just a lot of uh, of anger. And I think that would exist without social media, but I think it's certainly been uh, been amplified by it. You know, the 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 story that was being told for for a while. Uh, was that the reason that we have all this animosity in the United States is that there are no longer swing voters, uh, that everybody's just uh, mobilizing their their bases, and that's what elections right. are. But if we look at uh, if we look at the the midterm elections uh, that just ended, um, remember uh, leading up to it, Carrie Lake, who was the uh, Republican candidate for governor of Arizona, stood up at a rally and said, are there any John McCain Republicans out there? Get out of here if you are, which would, would have just been nonsensical in any other time. You would have thought you want every uh, vote you can get. But in the end, uh, that's what ended up making the difference were swing voters and people who were splitting their ticket or voting differently than they had in the past. Do you see in that some hope? Maybe we're not just turning into red America versus blue America in in all these these monolithic ways. Is there some hope there? I think so. I think so. I I mean, I'd say just as a a broad statement, I think the American capacity for self-renewal is really impressive. It's one of the impressive Mm -hmm. things in the history of, of... of the world. And, and also, uh, viruses create their own antibodies. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, so the division, the acrimony, the anger, uh, the hatred that marks politics, I think for a majority of people, they're not really happy with that. That's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, it, there was a study a few years ago leading up to the 2020 election called the exhausted majority. And I think that that captured, uh, what was, what was happening that the weird thing is going on is, is our, our our politics um, is is so amped up um, because I think there are certain structural problems. Um, one of the things which which you know about is that often members of Congress, particularly in the House, their main fear is not a general election; it's a primary election, yeah. which is determined by the the base of a party, which tends to be the most energized and extreme part of a party. And so you've got a lot of people who are playing to to that. So that's one thing. Second thing is that the number of true independents, people who split their votes, is relatively small. So a lot of politicians have made the calculation that we have to go for turnout, not mm-hmm. for appealing to uh, independents. Um, I think this last midterm election pushes back somewhat against it for the reason you said. You had massive turnout. You've had actually massive turnout for the last three elections. 2018 midterm was a record turnout for midterm. The 2020 presidential election was a record turnout. And then this last one, 2022, was a near record turnout. So you've got both bases turning out in huge numbers, uh, which means that there needs to be an appeal to you know, to to some uh, some independents and and a hope for for uh, people who who split their split their their votes. Uh, we'll have to see. I mean, in in politics, winning um, is replicated, mm-hmm. and I think what has to happen is that there have to be figures in both parties um, and individuals in both movements that model a different kind of politics and shows it can win. And mm-hmm. I think once that happens, you'll get a lot of people who who will, will follow, or the reverse, which is if you model a certain kind of politics, dehumanization, hatred, conspiracy theories, and so forth, that you'll lose. Um, that's the language, unfortunately, that a lot of people in politics understand. Moral appeals don't always work, but if they think that decency is 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 a pathway to victory. 
then um, then you've got a chance to to see it on a, on, a, on a more widespread basis. And that in turn just depends on what we, the American people do. We're not, uh, you know, corks caught in in currents that we mm-hmm. have no control over. I mean, this is Although a self-governing it republic. Yeah. It's some, it feels that way. But in the end, we get more or less the government that we deserve. Um, and we need enough people who care about the right things to make their voices heard. Voting is one way. There are a lot of others. Um, but if that happens, if if people stand up for, for honor and decency uh, and, and integrity, um, then our politics will resemble that. If people don't, if they are themselves peddling, interested in advocating, looking for others to, to push for dehumanization and, and, um, and hate will, you know, we'll get, we'll get, uh, we'll get that. But this is always, this is an ongoing struggle mm-hmm. and it's never settled. It's never settled. Mike Cosper and I were talking on the bulletin uh, last week or maybe the week before about uh, something that Adam Kinzinger said that is, is completely true uh, in, in my experience, not only in the political realm, but also in the church realm. He, he said, there are a lot of people who think that the reason that you have members of Congress who think one thing and say another, which is, as you know, a lot of them, uh, the reason for that is not so much that they're thinking, here's power and I want to accumulate this power, although there is some of that. He said that a lot of it is just not wanting to deal with the grief of going back to your uh, Lincoln day, if you're a Republican or your Jefferson Jackson day, I guess they probably don't have Jefferson Jackson day dinners anymore, uh, but whatever they're being called uh, now, you don't want to get the grief from people coming up. And I thought about a United States Senator uh, who was talking about why he didn't take a convictional stand on a particular issue, even though he was retiring. And he said, you know, I just, I want to go to Hardee's and uh, drink coffee on Saturday mornings. And I won't be able to do that if I vote the other way. I just don't want the grief. And I've seen that a lot in churches in in which you have pastors or other leaders who are saying, you know, I just, I just have to get through the next few weeks. How, how, how does one make the decision? What's, what's worth uh, just saying, I'm going to hold on and address that later. And what's worth saying, okay, I have to address this right now, even if nobody will speak to me after it. How, how does a person make that decision in the moment? Yeah, it, it can be it can be tricky. And I think the human impulse is always to defer mm-hmm. um, because people don't want to have their lives unsettled. They don't, they don't like the 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 winds uh, and the rains they they'd rather go through and, and not be hassled they'd rather be able to go to go to Hardee's I think it really depends on some understanding some discernment um, in terms of what the moment is about mm-hmm. is 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 this a, a fundamentally important moment or is this an, an ephemeral moment is this an issue that really matters um, that goes to the core of certain things. Or are these the kind of differences that people can um, can can have? You know, they flare up. You have a debate one week, and three weeks later, it's you know, it's uh, it's it's forgotten. Is you know, if you're talking about what the top tax rate should be, is it forty one percent or thirty seven percent or twenty eight percent? That's a legitimate issue to debate. People can have opinions uh, about it. Um, it's not necessarily worth going to the mat. Over at least in my in my estimation, if you're talking about fundamental issues of uh, of truth um, of, of of American democracy of the if there's a survival of a country that can be melodramatic or the or, or the pillars of society that are necessary for a country um, to uh, allow for human flourishing um, on those matters matters of faith um, matters of deep principle. I think then you just you should speak up, and then it's a matter of whether people people do. But it requires courage, and you know, John Kennedy said about there's there's a reason that profiles and courage is a slim volume. Mm-hmm. It's not a a, a a virtue that a lot of people have. 
It's, it's an important one. Aristotle said it was the, the first of, of all the virtues, and a lot of others are derivative from it. But most people want to go along to get along, mm -hmm. and they rather uh, avoid these things. And then I think when people do it, the, the, the human mind, human psychology kicks in, and we have a tremendous ability, and I'm speaking here about myself too, just to rationalize certain mm -hmm. kinds of behavior. Um, because people, uh, none of us lives easily with cognitive dissonance. If, if you are living at, at odds with what you purport to believe or what you really do believe and your actions don't correspond to that, that can create a tremendous amount of internal tension. And so the mind then begins to, to set up a series of justifications and rationalizations for not doing the right thing or even for doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's happened a lot. People have come up with an awful lot of excuses of why they shouldn't speak up when on some deep level they knew it was important to speak up and that they should speak up. You know, one of the things that's really shocking to me uh, right now is seeing, uh, for instance, the, the Paul Pelosi uh, attack uh, with, a, with a hammer. It's not that that sort of thing happens. We've, we've had political assassinations and attempted assassinations at many points in American history. What was shocking to me is that this happened and there were so many people who would joke about it. Uh, yes. and, and prominent people uh, who would who would joke about it. And there was this lack of humanity. And I noticed the same thing uh, on the right and on the left. Uh, I, I was noticing there's a, a right wing uh, figure uh, who's suffering from COVID right now. And I just looked at the responses on social media and you had people. This is this is what you deserve. Sort of a right. thing. And you see it. You see it in 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 probably right now more on the right. Do you see that than on the left? But it exists in, in both places. And I was, we, we started out talking about Mike uh, Gerson. Uh, one of the things that I was noticing uh, when it was announced that, that he died is that there were some people who would say, well, he wrote speeches uh, that were uh, that were for uh, George W. Bush in the lead up to the Iraq War. That means that this is an evil person. Doesn't matter what he did with AIDS in Africa and and so forth. And it's not only that's just really callous at, at a time of someone's death. It's also I think because people don't realize and remember what it seemed was going on uh, at the beginning of the Iraq war or what, what it, it really did seem as though Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, that that would be the case. And so there were a lot of us uh, who, uh, who supported military action uh, in Iraq back after September 11th, who looking back would say, well, if we knew everything that we know now, uh, we wouldn't have, have done that. I'm not assuming that that you have a different opinion of the Iraq war than you did when you were in the Bush administration. I'm just, I'm just asking you, there are going to be things, not just in those big policy levels, but there are going to be things that a pastor does or that a mom does or uh, that somebody in their, their business, something that looking back, they say, I regret that. I, right. I wish that I had done that differently. And I've seen people handle that different ways. I've seen some people sort of double down and just become really cynical. <laughs> and I've seen people kind of fall into despair and, and lose their confidence when they have some regrets. How do, you, uh, how do you counsel people to deal with regret and, and, and mistakes that they've made in life? Yeah, I, I'll just say, because the, on, on the Iraq war, I mean, I do have regrets two really large, I would say, significant ones um, on, on that. The first was um, that we went to war based on uh, a false premise, which is that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. That was not something that, that we knew about. Um, and uh, so it, it, it wasn't a failure of character. And in, in that sense, nobody was lying about it. The simple way to, to know that is... Um, Nobody would go forward and 
uh, articulate the premises of a war that you knew would be shown to be false once the mm -hmm. war began. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody like Colin Powell, who was not a warmonger, went before the UN. He had spent three, three nights, two days at, at Langley at CIA to go over the information when he did the UN speech. So it, in that case, it was not a, 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 a willing, uh, it wasn't a lie. It wasn't, wasn't willingly misled. Having said that, it was wrong. And we said things that were wrong, um, and it had uh, tremendous consequences. Um, and, um, you know, we tried to do due diligence, but we didn't do it well enough, and that is really on us. And the second thing is um, that the uh, phase four operation after the after the major combat operations, we had the wrong premise in terms of uh, what was needed in Iraq. It was the light footprint strategy, which allowed chaos to go to to go forward. So that is a re regret that uh, that I uh, that I have, um, and I think it's important to be able to acknowledge that if the facts you know lead you to 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 that. Um, in terms of how people in general deal you know deal with regret in their life, whether it's personal or or professional, some of it depends, I think, on, uh, of course, on the magnitude of, uh, of the regret. Um, and, 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 uh, so that facts and circumstances, um, matter. Um, if there are individuals, um, that you as you have hurt, uh, or wounded or slandered, it's important to repair those and repair mm -hmm. those, I think, in an, in, a, in an honest way to go to people and to speak honestly about that and do what you can to, to repair, uh, to repair that. Um, and if it's non-personal, but it has to do with, with, with professional issues or, or, or other matters, you just try and correct what, what went wrong. Um, but all of us have regrets in life. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us have stumbled and fallen. Um, uh, you know, Paul referred to himself as the chief of sinners uh, and, um, and so we have to be able to accept grace, um, for regrets. I, I found in life, you may have too, that, um, in order to be a dispenser of grace, you, you have to have been the recipient, mm -hmm. not necessarily you have to have been, but it helps to have been the recipient of grace yourself. Yeah. Um, knowing grace from God, having received grace from from others, and when you've received that grace, I think it's easier for you to to give it. And I think it's important that people, you know, not beat themselves up for not having led led uh, led a perfect life. So you try and uh, create correct uh, what it is that you regret, but then you go on uh, in life. Uh, you don't try not to let it shadow you. Um, you learn from it if you're wise um, yourself and you have other people to try and help you learn from it. Um, and in the end, you, you hope that, that your, your life has more pluses than, than minuses when, when the story is told. Mm. You know, when, when I think about this issue, I think a lot about Amanda Ripley, who talks about, and I don't like the war metaphor with anything, but she talks about the necessity to be able to welcome back uh, enemy combatants. Right. Now, really, no matter what, no matter how how big or small the issue is, where people actually can change their minds, and and that's not going to be held over them. So that you may have uh, someone maybe in a, in a church or in a small group that was really wrong uh, and maybe behaved really badly in some situation. You have to be willing for those people to change their minds and to be be greeted back in the community, because otherwise what you end up with is this sense of, uh, okay, I've already made this step and that means I can only keep walking in this direction. Right. That's not only a violation of a Christian understanding of grace. It also doesn't work. And right. I think we're living in a time where that is maybe the hardest thing uh, in American life is for people, A, to change their minds on something, Right. But B, to be uh, to, to, to be welcomed back once they have. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good insight. It's 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 true. Um, sometimes there's a there's a feeling of wanting to hold it over a person mm -hmm. and saying, even if you change your mind, you're not welcome back because you got it wrong, um, for, you know, for, for a long period of time or because of what you said or did when you did have it have it wrong. 
Um, but I think it, from a Christian perspective, um, it's not the right way to, 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 to approach it. Um, and I, I, you're also right that from a utilitarian perspective, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work either. I mean, you have to give people, uh, in life exit ramps and, and entrance ramps, mm. uh, to be able to get off of certain, um, roads that they're on and to enter into or, or join certain, certain roads that they're, that they're on. And, um, and we shouldn't go out of our way to make that, you know, more or less difficult. It's one other thing that you mentioned earlier that I, I we wanted to touch on because I think it's an important point, which is um, this idea about, you know, when we are dealing with uh, people who have views that are different than ours, you were, you were mentioning some, some people like with the Iraq war with Mike and, and, and others. Um, it's the sense that uh, if a person holds views that are different than mine, it must be evidence of a deep character flaw, right? Uh, or that they themselves are are uh, are wicked, and that's a challenge that we all have. And it's it's a challenge in politics. It's a challenge in theology. It's a challenge in all sorts of different arenas of life. And I think the the mistake that we make is we assume that other people have the same hierarchy of values and often the same life experiences, the same shaping influences. And so if somebody come, arrives at a position that's different than ours, I think we often think, how could they arrive at a different position? Because they think that, they're ex that the experiences of the other people are the same as us. Their mm -hmm. thought process is the same. The value systems that they hold are the same. And if that were the case, then the only way that they could end up on the wrong side, uh, quote unquote, of an issue is if it was a character defect. Mm -hmm. And in fact, all of us are shaped by so many different factors, yeah. family of origin, the community we're part of, teachers that we had, the country that we're a part of, uh, the sources of information that we that we rely on. Um, and, uh, you know, Jonathan Haidt, our, our mutual friend, so, the social psychologist at, at NYU, wrote The Righteous Mind, talks about how liberals and conservatives put premium on different values. Um, and so you, we're all bringing to life different grids. Mm -hmm. And that's how we often end up with, at different different points or different positions. And if you lose sight of that, I think there, that is often why we end up feeling like we want to shake somebody and say, how can you believe this? Mm -hmm. Or why don't you see things the same way that, that I do? Um, so some degree of, I'd, I'd say... Uh, you know, epistemic humility is 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 in order for all of us, including me. We mentioned a, a few minutes ago our eulogies, and I'm I'm curious, um, what would you hope for your own life um, when when we we do let, let's hope many 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 years from now uh, when the people are there honoring your life. What would you hope that people would say about Pete Weiner? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of moving question. Um, I, I guess what I would hope that they would say is that my life in the main was a life of integrity, um, that I loved well, um, that I loved um, particularly family and friends, but others well. Um, and that I was, um, I tried to be faithful uh, servant of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I got things wrong for sure, but um, that that's what I was trying to to do and to uh, to be. Mm. Well, I think there are many of us who can give that testimony about you now, and we don't want to give that testimony about you in a eulogy sense for a long, long time, but we could definitely see that in your life right now. Uh, Pete, I'm just really grateful uh, for your, not just your insight and your wisdom, but your friendship. There are so many times when uh, I've told uh, Maria, I don't know that I would be sane if it weren't for a very small group of people, including Pete Weiner, uh, through this time. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I'm really grateful for your taking time to be with us today. It's been a pleasure, uh, Russell, as I said. I'm a great admirer of you. And um, we've always needed your voice, but more now than ever. And uh, I count you as a, as a close friend. And uh, 
And one of the uh, people, uh, when I was talking about models, you're uh, you're one of them. So th- thanks for your ministry. Thanks for your friendship. And, and thanks for having me on the podcast. And we'll keep, keep a slot open for Mike in the book club, and we will see him Amen. soon. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Russell Moore Show today. Be sure to subscribe, send it along to somebody that you think uh, would uh, benefit uh, from this conversation. Leave a review. It helps folks uh, to find us. And click on the cover art if you're listening on a smartphone and you can find uh, additional resources, including how to find links to some of the articles by Pete Wainer that we talked about, uh, we talked about in this broadcast. This is Russell Moore. You're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Hosted by Russell Moore, produced by Ashley Hales, Associate Producers, Abby Perry and Azare Phelps. CT Administration, provided by Christine Kolb. Social Media, by Kate Lucky. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Production Assistance, provided by Core Media. Audio Engineer is Kevin Duthu. Coordinator is Beth Grabencourt. Video Producer is John Rowland. The theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. 